Oh, continental divide. And some repackaged by Eagle Griffin. Oh. <laughs> so this game gives me uh, some pause as to how much I trust my methodology in terms of determining how much I want to gain. Regardless of what information I can give to the players, uh, viewers. If I hadn't played a game of it and failed and then come back to it, but I was already seeing glimpses in the game that failed, I don't think I would have seen as much about this game to like as uh, I have. Now, <sighs> some of that has to do with a couple of things. One is the components. The, um, at least for this version, I'm finding some of the colors to be just way too close together, um, where it's difficult to distinguish unless you have like cleat lights shining on it or something. I've got quite a bit of light here, and I had trouble um, uh, being able to distinguish one company from the other. So there's a color issue there. Uh, it was also, and, and that added to the headache, it was also a misprint on the Eagle Griffin map up here where they got rid of uh, part of the Continental Divide. <laughs> and you kind of have to look at the old map, there's online images, to be able to tell. But I guess the biggest thing is, there's a startup cost to playing this that's just too high. And it's a stupid startup cost, which is, in order to find the reasonable routes, the first time, two times you play it maybe, you have to really study all these hexes the costs that they have and the payouts that they have. Um, now, you have to play to get certain understandings about the game, even if you could understand what the good routes were uh, beforehand, because there's a certain delicate balance between income, distance, costs, and all that that's not going to be apparent to you. But it's fairly apparent early on, uh, you know, with a little bit of, with a significant amount of study of the board, uh, that, gee, there's only a couple of ways through the board that make any sense at all. And there's a lot of board that doesn't make a lot of sense. The board could have actually been shrunk down quite a bit. Uh, one thing though, those tiny hexes do give you some capability. If you're able to get the jump on someone, you could actually buzz past them with some collaboration or with enough cash or whatever and steal their route. So it could be that multiple people would fight over the same, uh, that more people would fight over the route than is allowed by the game rules. Uh, in the game, you're allowed three uh, companies in each hex, which basically means that you identify the couple of good routes and there's going to be three companies on each of those routes going across. Well, there is some capability to sneak in there and steal that good route. And that could pretty much fry uh, the company that got cut off. But there's some risk in doing this. However, like I said, there's like basically two good routes. So there's six that I can see. Uh, there's basically six companies out of what, eight? That, uh, that are going to get those good roots. Now, in a six-player game, uh, everybody can get one good route. And more players, or in less players, you might find yourself in a position where um, there are opportunities that exist on some not-so-good routes. And we kind of saw that. Uh, but that two good routes, that's not entirely true. And here's why. 
Only two companies can make it on the northern route, and only two companies could make it on the southern route. The central route could conceivably uh, support, assuming three companies are running there, um, striking distance to all five of the final ports. And that means that that central route, which is already pretty damn good, becomes all the better because it's the mo only flexible uh, path that really exists. Hey, there's probably some capability to, to hit things you weren't expecting some of the times, but there really are a limited number of cubes, so you can't uh, perform that. Anyway, the startup cost issue is figuring out what those decent routes are, and then there's this color problem. And it's like, the first game you're going to play of this, especially if you're with a group of people who are all playing for the first time, you just are not going to be playing this game. You're going to be playing something else, which is diddle around and try to, you know, figure out those good routes and then find out that, yeah, this one didn't work. It looked like it might have survived, but no. It just, the game's cut too close. Uh, it's too tight a design for there to be enough leeway for someone who takes not one of the optimal routes to have uh, a good chance of getting the victory points that they need to get. Um, however, <laughs> there's something really delightful about the player interaction that shows up in this game that probably if I hadn't screwed up the first time and had just even remember what my error was. Oh, it had to do with the price of stocks, and it was huge, a uh, huge problem. Me just misunderstanding the rules. But um, if it ha if I hadn't uh, made that error, I probably would have played a very flawed game, like most people will see of this the first time they play it, in which, yeah, okay, so a couple of us ended up picking good routes, and we did okay, and everybody else was kind of out of the game and not able to do anything. And you really need a fair number of players to be in the game and doing strong and well for all of the interactions with the shares to work out. Um, on top of that, another big negative this one has is the share price calculation, uh, figuring out how much you're, you know, you can pay for a given share of that, or you must pay for a given share of a stock when you want to buy it, is a painful uh, mechanical calculation. And that's one that's actually pretty important uh, and has to be done quite often. It gets easier with time. You start learning to you know, do your divisions and additions and everything. It's all just arithmetic, but it's cumbersome. And that will also strongly degrade from your first game of it in terms of yeah, I've got to do all this crap and then balance out, you know, instead of just looking at what the value of the stock is on one track, you basically have to reference three tracks and do some, some arithmetic to figure out what the value is. And there would be no easy way uh, to handle that except with like, you know, an app or a, a little calculator that, that was designed to run this. Because this game gives you a lot of interesting levers on the stock that most winsome games don't. You get to set the starting stock value, and that's going to be your baseline. Instead of income just being sort of the stock value of something here, income divided by the number of shares that are released, another little lever you have, you get to set the stock value, you get to set how many shares you're releasing, uh, ends up determining and it's a per share income, ends up determining the value of that stock. It's the base value of the stock that was set initially plus whatever the expected income at that moment is. And that at that moment changes, you know, each time the company lays track. So that adds to a lot of the kind of decision making and the kind of choices that you have in the game. Hey, will I have enough? Yeah, I mean, you could take this to the extreme. Will I have enough cash to buy two shares of this company? 
if I build so much track, should I hold off on track? Wow, there's a short time distance though of the overall game. I need to get to where I need to make my turns. <laughs> the straight line track is kind of weird. Um, that really imposes a limitation on you and it helps uh, make the decisions very difficult in this game. Okay. As a game overall, I think this one, once you can get over those hurdles, if you could see the colors of the cubes, if you can do the calculations comfortably, um, this one really, really shines. There's something really fantastic about uh, the way that the collaboration in the stocks works. Most of the winsomes, there's kind of a, oh, I've got to share, we're both working together on this. Oh wait, I'm more invested in this, well, I'll ignore this company on my turn. In this one, if you're the majority or a majority holder in a company, you get to run that company no matter what, kind of like an XX. The company's going to run, it's going to make, it's going to lay its track, it's not going to lay fallow, uh, no matter what it's out of money <laughs> and or cubes um, that's another thing you have a really limited number of cubes which means even on those best uh, uh, routes that you could find you don't have a lot of room to dick around which is why chances are someone's not going to steal your route it's too expensive in cubes uh, they only have a couple of cubes leeway and that probably means that the dynamic of their profit that they have to pull in, the income that they make um, off the railway, and um, yeah, and the space limitation that they have in terms of how many cubes that they have to reach their objectives is just going to be too tight and they're not going to be able to swerve in and cut you off and still have a viable starting company. So basically, the three companies that take one of the primary routes first, it's very unlikely someone else is going to find a good enough starting route that isn't one of those three and then be able to slide in and still, you know, still be strong enough to be able to do it. Now, the strong enough is an interesting point because other players could invest in your corporation you know, and you could have multiple turns that way and be able to race it that way and you'll have excess cash. Uh, and you'll start making better income, but that income's not all gonna go into the company treasury anymore because you have too many stocks dispersed. So you have to make sure that there's a lot of stocks out there if that happens, which means that the income that each player makes off of their share of it is gonna be less, but that's okay. Because at the end of the game, basically you just wanna have the most certificates. Pretty much, uh, yeah, some could be fairly, some could be worth a great deal more than others. But by a great deal, what I saw in the, the game I played, and I think that looks pretty common, is the leading one was no, not twice the value of the least one. And that is a pretty big deal. Because what it means is you generally want to buy whatever you can get the most to sell, you know? And uh, that's kind of an interesting facet too. You can grab up multiple shares at once of an already started company. So even if you're behind in the company and don't get to run it, you can, if you have enough cash, you can get your chance to run it when you put your investment into it. Um, as a simulation, this game is pretty crappy. Yeah, it incentivizes westward uh, expansion and uh, a number of other things. The straight line track is more of a game mechanism which limits your choices as to how many, uh, you know, how far you can get off a single player. It's not the amount of money the company has that limits their track lays alone but how many straight lines they need to get to where they do, they're going, or how many turns they have to make to get there cheaply, or whatever you want to do. And the more turns you have to make, um, the more players you want running that company. 
And that's where the collusion comes in on this game. It's not really so much, although it can be, but it really isn't so much about putting that extra cash infusion into the companies as getting the extra actions so that you can um, deal with the uh, being able to shift your track a little bit. And that, that becomes a really big thing in the very late game where you're rushing for the ports. Um, one of the interesting things about this one is money, it matters, but it's not a victory condition. It matters hugely but, uh, because the more money you have, the more shares you can buy. Shares are what we need the game. The victory conditions, though, are based on a per share, not percentage of the company or anything like that. So a company with 10 shares is worth more potential total victory points than you know one with three. Uh, the per share victory point is based on what that corporation has managed to do, what mileposts is hit, and then there's a special bonus if you get to San Francisco instead of one of the other ports, it gets an extra point. And there's an extra point available if the shares all sell out. Shares all selling out makes you think, oh, I don't want to put too many shares in play. And that may be valid in many cases, but a lot of cheap shares, at least in my game, sold out real fast because, although I got some extra change on hand, I can buy one or two of that, you know? And very quickly, so many people are working on it, it starts looking fantastic, even though it didn't have a lot of starting capital. And because it expands and starts looking good, it starts getting a decent income on whatever shares remain. The danger of that is once it sells out, it's not making any more money. Whatever cash it has, that's as far as it's going, and it's done. Anyway, going to the realism thing. Um, the track lane limitations seem completely fabricated. Uh, the stock market doesn't really represent um, terribly well. <laughs> sure, you know, starting value should have no importance as you get later in the game. And um, the income that you're making should also should should have a greater impact, I think, as it does in most of the winsome games. Most of the winsome games do a better job of creating a believable world in which you're running business, train businesses, and, and making uh, cash on it. And also, it's also more believable to say, you know, our goal is actually to make money off these corporations. Not just, you know, there may have been a few of the big investors who were like, yeah, make it to the Pacific, that's big, that's important. Most games benefit that by giving you some kind of bonus, um, either a, you know, a financial bonus right away or a victory point bonus at the end. But in this, it's not even that you particularly want to be there. You want to have the most shares of companies that got far. And it's just this really weird mishmash. It's not that you particularly have this goal to be the first of the Pacific or anything like that. There's no particular advantage to being the first, except your income might increase because of that. Um, what it, it's just very hard to look at it in any in any. Uh, it's very hard to come up with any rational explanation for the things that drive this game. So put aside any thought of this as a, uh, as a simulation of the railways. Rather, uh, I think it can only be really looked at as a game. And that's fine. I mean, it is a game, right? Uh, <laughs> with a theme, you know, <laughs> rather than a real study of a topic. And that's okay. Some, game, some things have to be games, uh, but that could be disappointing to people who are used to kind of the winsome stuff being a little bit more linked to what seems like reality. On the other hand, uh, people who are really into a little bit of different, uh, different twists on the mechanism of a regular winsome uh, design where there's some collaboration, some working together to get extra actions, to get extra funding, etc. Well, that's all here, but it's not just a little twist. This one is majorly different from those other designs. 
and uh, it, it gives you a really interesting state space to look at. I feel like you know I could play a few more games of this uh, and and really get some learning and enjoyment out of it. Learning in terms of how to, how to win the game, not in terms of anything of any importance outside of that. Uh, so, yeah, I, there's, uh, there's, there's a, enough room to explore this that maybe exceeds many of them. Um, but some of the disadvantages, the hurdles to getting started on this game and enjoying it the first time, and even the continuing hurdles, it's got a heavy burden. Looking at the, the pieces, maybe the original is better on that. Certainly they got the map, <laughs> you know, right. Uh, as well as, though, built into the system, making the calculations of the stock values. All that kind of decreases the overall enjoyment of this one. However, I don't know of another one that has... Um, quite the same kind of thinking involved in it. I'm not saying, oh, this is on a different plane of thinking. It's just, this is significantly different from most of the Winsomes. And I guess b &O kind of was too, with its very uh, 18xx feel to it, uh, which was kind of exciting to me. Uh, but m many of the Winsomes feel too samey. This one certainly doesn't. So, you know, if you're hunting down, well, let me get a couple of winsomes that I really like and, you know, I want them to be differentiated from each other. This one is probably one that you would want in your collection. Um, given this reprint and the color issues, the map is not that big a deal. I mean, I don't think the map is that much worse. It may be harder to read in general, that's the problem, but the little map error it's not that big a deal. Um, but the color issues, and if the map is more readable in the original one, um, eh, it's probably a better buy. <laughs> I'm just always attracted to the, ah, they decided to make it, you know, into one of the, their, their, their flagship, you know, games of it. That sounds great. Let's get that. You know, Chicago Express is really good, right? Um, well, Sometimes the flagship is a big step back in terms of uh, in terms of certain component issues, etc. Even though you get the nicer components, supposedly, yeah, they may not be as cleverly designed. All right, let's send this out. Uh, I hope I made gave some of the idea of why this one excited me. I know it's hard to express for me. <laughs> <laughs>